I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Hosni Mubarak remains in office, and questions remain for the country's Christians. Plus, celebrating a centuries-old anniversary at a local church. 1,600 years since the passing of who we call Marmaron. And he continues today to inspire the Maronite Church to holiness. And looking for marriage advice, you may want to turn to a saint. And if we do not have that interior freedom of self-mastery, then we cannot, in fact, make a simple gift of ourselves to another. We cannot give what we do not possess. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Following widespread reports that he would step down today, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak announced tonight that he would remain in office through September. In a televised speech, Mubarak said he would be delegating more authority to his vice president. Mubarak announced that he would, quote, admit mistakes. He also con commended what he referred to as the youth revolution happening across Egypt. Meanwhile, the country's vice president, Omar Suleiman, said the speech affirms Mubarak's commitment to the people and to respond to their demands. Well, demonstrators, meantime, had gathered earlier in Cairo's Tahrir Square ahead of Mubarak's speech. After learning he would not be stepping down, the crowd began shouting, get out. At least one person, at least one report rather, says that some of those people there left the square and were heading toward the presidential palace. And of course, many questions remain, particularly for Egypt's Christian minority, who do not know what a change in leadership will mean for them. I had a chance to talk about it earlier with Ed Clancy. He's of the humanitarian organization, Aid to the Church in Need. And thanks so much for joining us here. Uh, once again, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, of course, the situation, you know, uh, Hosni Mubarak really uh, kind of surprised a lot of people today with his speech. Uh, all of the reports that we saw coming out were Mubarak is going to resign. Uh, there was some conflict as to, uh, conflicting information as to what was going to happen then, but the general consensus was that he was going to step down. He did not. Um, a moment to breathe a sigh of relief because there's not suddenly chaos, or what do you think now should be the reaction? Well, um, I think uh, Mubarak is ever the survivor, that he's staying on even still. And um, I think the, fears will, the fear is that the, the disappointment in the, in the crowds will turn into something aggressive, something violent. And then if that happens, how does the military react to it and you know, what happens next? Mm -hmm. um, if not, uh, will the people just go back into their homes disappointed and sort of think, okay, life goes on as normal, uh, um, and then potentially would protesters disappear? Mm. You know, th that has often been the case where if, the, you're, if you're a leader of a group that the government doesn't like, you just go away. Yeah. Um, and all of these things could happen, and maybe that's what's on the minds of the protesters. They know that there's really no safe haven other than standing in front of the camera. Right. where the world can see. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you, know, you talk about uh, the, the reaction possibly being violent. I mean, really, the, the violence, any violence that we've seen so far had come from these bands of, of thugs, really, that had yeah. been going through the crowd on horseback and on the yeah. backs of camels. Exactly, and and, yeah. and, and I, I think uh, CNN's uh, Anderson Cooper and several other uh, reporters and crews were, you know, taken into custody, beaten, whatever, by those folks. But the protesters... Um, the anti-Mubarak protesters have been generally uh, peaceful, so the fear now is that through their uh, dejection and disappointment with this mm -hmm. announcement, that that will turn a corner. Where do Christians fit into to all of this, the, the Coptic uh, Christian community there in Egypt? Um, uh, things are still so much in, in limbo for them. Yeah, they, they occupy, they, they, they uh, compile, compi com Compose. <laughs> <laughs> compose. Yeah. Easy for you to <laughs> they say. Are, yes. They are. They compose uh, about 10% of the population. And they've been there since St. Mark. So they've been there a long time. So they have a very long and strong foundation within Egyptian culture. Um, and they do operate very well alongside, alongside their Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, so it, it's, it's likely that, you know, they will remain. Uh, the issue really is now what happens if there is a power grab. Mm. Who comes in and what position do they play or what position will they play? Mm. Currently they're limited to two positions in the Egyptian government and all others are Muslim. 
they're not allowed to be mayors of towns or, or uh, cities. Mm. You know, they really don't occupy any of the higher uh, elected offices. And yet, if it was sort of a fair representation, at least a portion of these governments would be run by Christians. So um, for Christians, I it's a time to hold their breath, I think. That right. they have to you know, really be careful because they have the most to lose. They yeah. really do. Well, one more question here. As, as long as there is this uncertainty, and since there is this uncertainty surrounding, okay, what happens after mm -hmm. Mubarak and how does it happen? There are still Christians out there uh, demonstrating. I think one of the more poignant images I remember seeing is uh, from, from some footage that we got from CNN was um, someone holding up a cross in the crowd and right next to it, someone holding up the Quran. Mm -hmm. the, the Christians and the Muslims side by side there protesting. So with all that uncertainty, the Christians are still out there, why? Um, I think the Pope said it well, that we're a people of hope, that, um, that Christianity by its nature is hopeful and is also, unfortunately, uh, has a history of martyrdom. <laughs> so people that die for their beliefs. So those two things in concert make the Christian culture and the Christian community willing to put their neck on the line to make a positive change. And I think that's the main reason why they're there. Well, we'll continue to monitor the situation, of course. And Clancy from Aid to the Church You Need, thank you so much for uh, being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. And of course, you can stay right here with Currents for all of the latest on Egypt. And stay tuned because there's much more ahead on this edition of the show. When we come back, the head of NATO weighs in on the plight of an Afghan man sentenced to die for converting to Christianity. We'll have that story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later with Valentine's Day around the corner, we'll get some relationship advice from a place you might not expect. But first, let's have a look at today's headlines. The head of NATO has weighed in on the case of an Afghan man sentenced to hang for converting to Christianity. Anders Rasmussen says the death sentence and any punishment for converting from one religion to another is in strong contradiction with everything NATO stands for. The statement came as an Afghani Christian Red Cross worker was told he would be hanged unless he converted back to Islam. From Rome now, there may not be much room at the inn, at least if you plan on being there for John Paul II's beatification. Rome reports says rooms, or some reports rather, say that rooms at hotels in Rome are booking up quickly, despite the fact that in some cases hotels are charging triple their normal rates. John Paul will be beatified on May 1st. It's the Feast of Divine Mercy, which is one week after Easter. And there is a celebration happening right now at the Holy See. Vatican Radio is turning 80. It was founded in February 1931. Uh, Guglielmo Marso Marconi, rather, the uh, inventor of the radio, yes, that would be Mr. Marconi himself, he set up a radio station in Vatican City at the request of Pope Pius XI. Vatican Radio was founded to make communication across borders easier during a time when totalitarianism was on the rise in Europe. And the Vatican is weighing in on that new iPhone confession app. Rome Reports has those details. The release of the confession application for the iPhone has raised questions whether it was still necessary to receive sacrament from a priest. The Vatican responded saying that this sacrament requires a personal dialogue that can't be replaced by technology. Vatican spokesman Federico Lombardi did say, however, that the application could be useful in helping people examine their conscience. The application was originally developed in the United States as a way for helping people to prepare for their confession. Well, turning now to Washington, debate continued for a third day in the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act. Today's debate centered on language in the bill that bans tax credits or deductions on amounts paid for abortions or health plans that cover abortions. Critics say that would amount to a huge tax increase, while supporters argue that tax credits and deductions are part of federal funding. Meanwhile, yesterday, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee heard testimony on a second bill that would specifically ban federal funding of abortions from last year's health care reform law. Well, in Colorado, a federal judge there ruled that an Air Force Academy prayer luncheon scheduled for today could take place as planned. 
In a lawsuit, plaintiffs argued that the luncheon violated the separation of church and state because it appeared the academy was sponsoring the luncheon. Plaintiffs also alleged that some faculty feared retribution if they did not attend. The judge dismissed the suit, though, saying it was clear that chaplains and not the Air Force Academy was sponsoring the luncheon and that uh, the event attendance was voluntary. Well, turning now to Florida, where Ave Maria University has announced that its founder, Thomas Monahan, is stepping down as CEO of the school. Monahan will relinquish the day-to-day -day oversight of Ave Maria. He'll remain on as chancellor and on the school's board of trustees. Last year, Monahan pledged to give away at least half of his fortune, which at one time was estimated to be half a billion dollars. Ave Maria announced today that Jim Tooney, will, who served in uh, President George W. Bush's administration, well, he will become the new, sup the new president of Ave Maria University. Well, promising news now from Arizona, where Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords has regained some ability to speak. Giffords was shot in the head in early January at a public event she was hosting in Tucson. A spokesman says that uh, a spokesman did not elaborate rather on what Giffords is saying exactly, but he did reveal that she's been asking for toast. Giffords' husband, astronaut Mark Kelly, has said that the prayers for his wife are being heard. And a closely watched Super Bowl wager has finally been settled. Pittsburgh Bishop David Zubik is sending a personal cash donation to Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Green Bay. Zubik is also sending food associated with Pittsburgh, likely pierogies and kielbasa, to a Green Bay food pantry. Mm, love some pierogies. Stay tuned, there's more currents coming up. Just ahead, we turn east to celebrate a saint. East, a hermit, an ascetic, he was one of the first in that region of Syria, northern Syria, that was called an open-air hermit. Welcome back. Egypt may be on edge following the latest news that Hosni Mubarak will remain in office through September, but another group with origins in the Middle East had reason to celebrate last night. Maronite Catholics, whose church was founded in Lebanon, celebrated the 1600th anniversary of the death of their patron, St. Maron. We sent our cameras to a local celebration at Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Catholic Cathedral in Brooklyn Heights, where the festivities took place alongside expressions of hope for the troubles in the Middle East. Today is special day, 1600 years since the passing of who we call Mar Maron. And he continues today to inspire the Maronite Church to holiness. St. Maron is one of the great unknown saints <laughs> in the church. St. Maron gave his name to the Maronite Church, but uh, he was a priest, a hermit, an ascetic. He was one of the first in that region of northern Syria. Because of his spirituality, because of his humility and his uh, priestly ways, he uh, attracted many people to Christ. And by this rich generosity of the first Maronites came this monastic movement that evangelized all of the Middle East and has come to us today. <laughs> Christianity is now a kind of a minority in the Middle East. It still is indigenous. It always was. It was there before Islam. But in its minority status, some of the Islamic countries are very, very stringent in the freedoms that they offer to Catholics and Christians of the Middle East. There's always been this um, persecution of the Christians in that area uh, of the world. And so, as a result, there's always been migration to other places, but they brought with them their faith, their tradition. Right now, the amazing uh, communion that exists among 21 Eastern Catholic churches and one Western called the Latin Church, it's an amazing unity, and it was shown very beautifully in the Synod last year, last October, for the Middle East, because there you had all the different patriarchs and, and bishops and priests from the different churches throughout the Middle East, and, and they were all in communion with the Holy Father. True to every good Eastern Christian, there's hospitality at the altar of Christ and there's hospitality at the table. So we invite everybody for a little meal afterwards. 
it's a special uh, celebration. We celebrate it in Lebanon. It's actually a national holiday. All the schools are closed. All the government closed their office. And uh, we, we, would we would like to do the same here in the United States in our community of faith. Our heart is with the Egyptian people. Uh, first, as an Arabic community. Second, we have the large Coptic uh, Orthodox community in Egypt. Uh, all what we can do for them is to pray for them. My prayers to them, uh, they, they're looking for freedom, uh, e equal right uh, for everybody. I hope they keep it peacefully, uh, try to uh, push the, uh, the issue for humankind. And I hope uh, throughout the world uh, people have uh, equal uh, opportunity and uh, uh, treat each other with love and dignity. My hope and prayer for the Coptic Christians, Catholic and Orthodox, is that, is that they would live under a rule of law that accepts them as a citizen with equal rights, equal dignity, and an equal opportunity to forge the future, to build an, a nation, Egypt, that is Muslim and Christian building together this civilization of love. That's my hope and prayer for this, this uh, new day for Egypt. Stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. When we return, listening to another saint to learn more about love and marriage couple are committed to each other, have given themselves to each other, and so can experience that intense pleasure within the safety of a committed relationship. Well, finally tonight, Valentine's Day is just around the corner. Quick reminder there, so, you know, if you want to avoid that last-minute Valentine's Day scramble, now is the time to get out there, get the flowers, the cards, the candy, or whatever else you might want to buy. And now might also be the time to get some advice on love, and for some of you, on marriage. Are you guilty of looking for love and love advice in all the wrong places? Tired of the advice columns and those self-help books that never seem to help? Well, one place you might want to try for some advice on love is the church. Yes, as a matter of fact, St. Vincent Ferrer Church on Manhattan's Upper East Side recently held its annual St. Thomas Aquinas Lecture, which this year took a unique look at Pope John Paul's groundbreaking teaching of theology of the body. There's been a lot of hubbub about the theology of the body, and there are a couple of blogging debates between various commentators on John Paul II's theology of the body. So we thought one way to clarify the discussion, perhaps, as well as one way to present what has become a rather popular teaching in this country is to introduce it apropos the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas, since John Paul II's own understanding of the theology of the body was rooted really in a Thomistic understanding of man. John Paul was a Thomist. You know, he was a Thomist. He was a devotee of St. Thomas Aquinas. And St. Thomas Aquinas' thought um, is part of his intellectual lineage and is in, in the background of his mind when he's writing the theology of the body. The human person is more than just a body, but we're also not just a soul. We're both a body and soul. And so your relationships with each other have to uh, include both body and soul. You have to be honest in your communications with each other. And that includes not just what you say to each other, but how you love each other, and then once you're married, how you communicate with your bodies in the bedroom. Marriage, you see, is the reasonable place for true and honest sexual expression, which takes into consideration not only the possible outcome, offspring, but in which the couple are committed to each other, have given themselves to each other, and so can experience that intense pleasure within the safety of a committed relationship. I thought it was very interesting when he said, uh, you cannot give what you don't have, uh, saying that you are not able to um, give yourself completely in marriage unless you have mastered yourself. When we are no longer masters of our bodies, our sensual desires, we are, in a sense, no longer free. And if we do not have that interior freedom of self-mastery, then we cannot, in fact, make a simple gift of ourselves to another. We cannot give what we do not possess. I think one of the good points that uh, Father Thomas Petrie made tonight about the theology of the body is that it's something that's uniquely popular in our country. And that just gives me the desire to reflect on our country's religious experience, our relatively young national history, 
are rather diverse in welcoming history, how all these things might contribute to what has become really the hot spot around the world for theology of the body. So that, that gave me something to really think about. Basically, St. Thomas uh, basically had the underpinnings of what we now know to be theology of the body that uh, John Paul sort of brought out now to the open that um, was there for, for centuries and now, you know, we're beginning to understand the roots of it. In fact, bring St. Thomas Aquinas back into the, to the discussion on marriage and the human person, because I think uh, the angelic doctor has a whole lot to offer our contemporary society and a lot of the contemporary debates about what marriage is and what it ought to be. If we wish to speak rationally about good and evil, we have to return to St. Thomas Aquinas. Well, that is it for tonight. Now, coming up tomorrow, it's the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, and we visit a food pantry that bears her name and is struggling to feed its clients in these hard times. And we'll also have the latest from Egypt on tomorrow night's show, so be sure and tune in for that. But in the meantime, you should have visit us online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.